thank you, Father John, for being with us here today, um, presenting the anointing of the sick. We look forward to everything you have to say. And if you will begin us in prayer, that would be wonderful. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Inspire all our actions, O Lord, we pray. Assist us by your grace, that every prayer and every work of ours may always begin with you and in you find its perfection through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Well, um, it's good to be able to chat with you. Um, it's interesting also, frankly, to be able to chat with you about some something which I am, <clears throat> which both Father James and I do so much. You know, um, we have a lot of opportunities to go to the hospital and to go sometimes to nursing homes and um, to visit people who are sick, to visit people who are um, at a certain moment and point in their life when they need to experience the, the comfort of the closeness of the Lord. and. The sacrament of the anointing of the sick is um, is a wonderful experience. I I, I sometimes think that, um, except for the fact that it's always dealing with people, almost always dealing with people in um, sad circumstances, um, it's almost one of my favorite sacraments to administer. To be honest with you, because um, it brings a great deal of comfort to people. All of the sacraments adapt us to a particular um, aspect of our lives in faith. Um, there are specific sacraments of vocation, for example. Hopefully, when I was ordained, um, the sacramental graces uh, began to adapt um, my life, my abilities, my soul to the things that I was being asked to do, uh, dedicate myself to. And there are challenges, of course, from time to time, but uh, I believe that the grace of the sacrament helps me in that particular um, series of things and um, the manner of my life and, and everything else. And I think such is also the case um, with the sacrament of holy matrimony. And the sacrament of holy matrimony um, works in both a practical way and in, um, you know, every sacrament confers uh, a deepening of the relationship with God. Everything, um, every sacrament confers a, a deepening in the possession of divine life, which is we call sanctifying grace. Participation in our created sense in the uncreated life of God. That's what sanctifying grace is for us. But the sacraments also confer on us um, things that are adapted to their particular purposes. And so the sacrament of marriage, um, as um, we pointed out the other night, uh, the new bower celebrated 11 years ago last Saturday night, you know, um, that sacrament with cooperation of the persons begins to work in their lives in such a way that it adapts them to the realities of married life. And again, you know, it doesn't mean that it takes away the challenges, but it means that it gives them the divine help that they need um, to be strengthened and the strengthening and enlightening of their minds and hearts, if they will allow, and all of those things that only God can confer. There's human diligence, certainly. We habituate ourselves to grace. Um, but also grace is something which is a gift. And so there's the old saying that grace builds upon nature. Hmm? 
In other words, we allow the grace to be at work in our lives. And, and, and such is the case also for the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Um, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick um, is given to those who have reached a point in their life's journey that having reached the use of reason, uh, they are now beginning to be in danger of death. And so it is about the most difficult struggle in some respects that we have, and that's dealing with our mortality. You know, um, just as a little aside, you know, uh, I never really, I mean, yes, I knew intellectually that, um, that I was mortal, you know, but I never really felt uh, anything about my mortality much. A um, couple of times when I was afraid I was going to be in a bad accident, but other than that, you know, you just go along, you go kind of, we all kind of go skating along and don't really think a great deal about our mortality. And that changed for me personally when I reached my 60th year because I stopped to think about the reaching of that milestone year. Um, how long did my parents live? And then I realized um, rather interestingly um, with rather some feeling um, that mortality would become over the next few years, uh, an increasingly great challenge. And that ultimately, I would succumb to my mortality. You know, my body um, will die. And what does the sacrament of the anointing of the sick help us to do? It helps us to begin to adapt ourselves to that reality, that reality as it becomes more pressing upon us. And so at some point due to age, due to sickness, due to injury, due to some other condition, the church says that the sacrament of the anointing of the sick may be conferred on those who are in need. Now, it's interesting because this particular sacrament um, used to be called the sacrament of extreme unction. Um, initially, extreme unction meant that it was the last of the sacramental anointings. In other words, um, we're anointed when we are baptized. We are anointed when we receive the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, for those who are ordained, they are anointed again with uh, sacred chrism. But this is the last of the sacramental anointings. Um, this is the, uh, the ultimate, in a sense, uh, time that we experience that need. And so the church reaches out um, with oil, which gives strength, which, with oil, which gives comfort. Um, and so that's one of the uses of oil in the sacramental system is the bestowal of strength and the bestowal of comfort and consolation. And so the sacrament used to be called extreme unction, first of all, as the last sacrament that is its a last sacramental anointing. And secondly, because it was more um, in the nature of the mind of the church and the administration of the sacraments, that um, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick be conferred when a person was in extremis. And um, in a sense, there, there are two little terms, and I'll so that we have a difference between in danger of death and at the point of death. At the point of death is in periculo mortis, in articulo mortis, rather, at that moment of articulation between life and death, and in the danger of death. And so now the discipline of the sacrament is to comfort people 
with the sacramental anointing, when they become in, in danger of death. And so that's why you see sometimes um, masses for the conferral of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And many times you'll see older parishioners who will come to that periodically, or sometimes, you know, will go to the nursing home and have a, a mass or a prayer service with the people and anoint them um, as they are uh, dealing with their mortality. Because one of the benefits of the sacrament is to begin to work to identify the person with Christ in his suffering and in his death so that they may be joined with him in his triumph over sin and death, in his resurrection. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Now, the other thing that is um, important is that we find this in the scriptures. And the primary reference, we have a reference in St. Mark's Gospel, at St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, um, verse 13, which reminds us that the disciples were sent out by the Lord, and they dispelled demons, and they anointed people, and in anointing those people, they healed. The specific reference, which is most important to us in the conferral of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, comes at um, the letter of St. James, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is actually quoted in the rite of anointing. Is there any sick among you? Let such a one bring in the priest of the church and let them pray over him. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick man. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he be in sin, they shall be forgiven. So that really encapsulates for us um, the power of the sacrament. Because the sacrament is connected with the sacrament of reconciliation, because it forgives the sins of those who um, cannot make confession, um, it, is only, it is only given by the priest or the bishop. Um, it's not able to be given by a deacon. Deacons can certainly go and pray um, deacons can administer some of the other rites of prayer over the sick, the bringing of Holy Communion to the sick and to the dying, um, but only the priest and the bishop can confer the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. The sacrament of the anointing of the sick is performed um, with a vegetable oil, usually olive oil. Usually the olive oil is the one that is blessed by the bishop for all of the diocese um, and for the use of the church at the chrism mass, which is celebrated um, during Holy Week. The bishop gathers with the priest and the bishop is the, is the font of the sacramental life in the church. The bishop gathers um, in the midst of his presbyterate, his um, gathering of priests who work with him and who extend the ministry throughout all the dioceses, and they pray together and they celebrate the Eucharist together, and it is during that time that the bishop um, blesses the three sacramental oils. The oil of catechumens, which is used in the rites of uh, Christian initiation, um, the oil of the sick, which is used for this sacrament of the anointing of the sick and um, the sacred chrism. The first two oils are blessed. The chrism is consecrated. And the consecration of the chrism, the consecrated chrism is used, of course, uh, as a sign in baptism of the illumination of the spirit as the principal oil of the sacrament of, of confirmation, 
and also as the oil which is used to anoint the hands of a priest and the head of the bishop. And um, there is also, however, a provision in the right that the individual priest who is conferring the sacrament may, uh, may um, bless enough oil to be used in the sacrament um, for that particular bestowal of the sacrament. So it permits the priest who is going to celebrate, if he for some reason doesn't have oil, he can take a small uh, quantity of oil, he can bless that oil, and he can use it for the anointing of the sick. Why is that? It's conferred upon the priest, that's a kind of a faculty which is conferred upon the priest so that no one should ever go without the comfort and the consolation of the sacramental anointing of the church. Because the most important thing, particularly as the sacrament forgives sins, the most, the, the, the most important thing to the church is the salvation of souls. And so the, the priest is able to do that um, so that no one should ever miss receiving the sacrament. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? I have a question. Yes. Um, I know that the, maybe I'm mistaken, uh, but is the baptism, does anybody, you said that the anointing, uh, anointing of the sick can be only given uh, by a priest or a bishop. Yes. But, but in the baptism can be given by anyone. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering why, and I understand, I think, why, but a, but what if a sick person is not able to, I mean, is not able to have access to the priest? Um, well, someone can go and pray. You know, it's just about, and you know, anyone can baptize. I mean, St. Augustine reminds us that even a pagan person can baptize. Right. Because that baptism is is most um, is most 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 important, you know, and it, it's that that adapts the soul in belief to the to the redeemer. Um, the other sacraments, however, um, are conferred according to the the priestly orders. You know what's you know what is um, you know what they, what they are capable of doing. So yeah. yes, a lay person, a lay person can um, can confer baptism. Yeah, a lay person can also, in certain situations, um, witness the vows of marriage. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, but only in certain, only only in certain circumstances. But but yeah. Because those are those are sort of practical things that, you know, sometimes, you know, people may in mission countries have to go years and years without. And that's also possible, you see, because the um, because the couple actually confer the sacrament on each other. In marriage, the couple are the are the ministers of the sacrament of marriage in the in the Latin church. In the Eastern Church, the the couple confer the the vows upon one another with the intervention of the priest for the blessing. Yeah. Father John, so, I have more yeah, sure. Um, I read an article recently about um, a nun that was giving last rites. I'm I'm sure the art I didn't the article was probably written without complete knowledge of what was going on, but. Um, has anything changed because of coronavirus, like in our diocese or around, like in the country, about um, what can be done at the end of someone's life? Has anything changed? Because well, of that? no, but but you know, your use of the term "last rites" is good. I was going to bring that in at the end, but we can certainly bring it in now. Last rites customarily is a sort of a complexus of sacramental rites. Um, which is done for people at the ending of their lives. 
And last rites is, um, is composed of several different things. So last rites, um, for example, if someone is dying and, um, and we don't use the term last rites kind of as much as it used to be used, but um, last rites is, um, so if someone is dying and they say, um, you know, a relative calls or they, they call and they say, I'd like to receive last rites. Customarily that would infer, that would re, uh, refer to um, uh, sacramental confession and absolution, um, the bestowal of the apostolic pardon, um, which is an indulgence given at the end of life. Um, it would also involve um, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And it would involve the, um, the reception of the Holy Eucharist specifically as viaticum, food for the last journey in life. That's what's called last rites. Now, the sacrament of penance and the sacrament of the anointing of the sick need to be conferred by the priest. Um, but prayers and prayers of commendation for the dying and the reception of Holy Communion as the food for the last journey, which are parts of the last rites, okay? Um, those can be conferred by a lay person or by a religious. And the church does permit the church, uh, the church does permit people to pray um, that the person receive the apostolic pardon. So those are elements which are um, often uh, referred to as last rites. And that's probably what, um, that's probably what they were, what the article was referring to. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, so what does the sacrament of the anointing do? Most importantly, it unites the person to the suffering of Christ, Christ in his passion, Christ in his dying, so that they may be united with Christ um, in his resurrection, his victory over sin and death. Um, also, it strengthens the person to um, endure their suffering, um, to have peace in the time of their difficulties and not to despair. As I said before, for those who are unable to receive the sacrament of uh, reconciliation, um, it is possible for, it is, uh, it forgives their sins. The sacrament of the anointing forgives sins. Sometimes, um, it, it also brings about um, physical healing or physical healing can sometimes be associated with the conferral of the sacrament. I, I, was, um, I was a very young priest and um, went to the hospital for a woman who was lying on a gurney and um, she'd been in a coma and her family were thinking that she was going to die and she was close to death. And um, we prayed together and I reached down and I anointed her. And then we prayed the Lord's prayer together. And after I had anointed her, um, all of a sudden there were four of us praying and or there were four of us praying the Lord's prayer and all of a sudden, the fifth, joy, uh, fifth voice chimed in. And I really saw it happen, you know. Um, something about that moment of the closeness of Christ to that woman in her suffering uh, drew her out of the coma. And that's one of those things. It doesn't happen very frequently, you know, you don't. But it, it was a real thing, and it really happened, you know. Um, it was one of those little amazing things. Most of the time, what the sacrament does for people who are dying, though, is it helps them to have ease in their passing, you know. Um, 
there are a number of people that I've had the opportunity to anoint at the ending of their lives, including my own mom. And the reception of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick um, was a great comfort. They could then uh, allow themselves simply to surrender to the arms of the Lord, which was uh, an amazing thing. So um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, I talked about the oil. I talked about when it's blessed. Um, the way that the sacrament is conferred is by the anointing, um, first of all, on the forehead, and then upon usually the palms of the hands. So in the formula that is prayed, the prayer that is prayed, as the uh, person is anointed, is through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. And that's usually as the forehead is being anointed. And then, if possible, the palms of the hands. May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. Amen. So those are the prayers which are prayed. Uh, in all of the prayers, um, there's an action. In all of the sacraments, there's an action and uh, a form, a prayer, which uh, specifies the action. Just as in baptism, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the proper form. And that's the those are the only words that can be used to confer the sacrament of baptism. These are the words that are used in the Latin church to confer the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Customarily, the priest anoints with his hand. One of the things, uh, Rebecca, that has changed is um, it's more frequent now for us to use an instrument um, when anointing. Uh, uh, um, a Q-tip, for example. And then we bring that home and it's burned. So that's one of the small things that has happened. Um, or you anoint with a glove, perhaps. Father, may I ask a question? Yes. You had said that the sacrament is for those who have reached the age of reason. Yes. Is that seven or is that eight? 15, which, which well, is the reason? It's, the, it's, it, it's usually, customarily, it's the age of seven. Yeah. And it's just for Catholic? children and adults so you wouldn't annoy them. well you know here's the thing um let's talk a little bit about who may receive so the sacrament is to be received by those who have reached that point where they begin to be in the danger of, of death secondly they are of the age of reason thirdly they um they are alive you know because um, there's a little, um, you know, sometimes people say, you know, my mom didn't receive the sacrament. Can you go to the uh, mortuary and anoint her? And of course, we can't do that. Um, if you're very close to the time of death, however, um, we do sometimes confer the sacrament conditionally. You know, for example, if the, if the person um, if the person, you know, there's a, there's a little lag between, you know, biological death and clinical death and legal death. And, and so, you know, um, if there is still life in the body, even if there is not conscious expression of that life, um, we can anoint uh, conditionally. Okay. So what about who can be anointed? Um, anointing, uh, the anointing of the sick is one of those sacraments that can be conferred um, upon any baptized person with faith. You know, um, on occasion, um, someone who has, who has faith, even though they are not Catholic, um, will have a Catholic spouse, uh, a Catholic child, and um, as long as they're not 
as long as they're not adverse, you know, they show, um, and matter of fact, one of the things I did was I went back like a good canon lawyer and I read my, I read my, reread my canons. And, <laughs> and one of the canons says this, the anointing of the sick is not to be conferred upon those who, who um, persevere obstinately in manifest grave sin. So in other words, those who are not um, disposed to receive God's forgiveness, you know, that's the deal. They're not disposed to receive God's forgiveness. So, so that would be like when a daughter says, come see my dad, you know, my dad is dying and he can't talk anymore, but really he hates the Catholic church and he's never, he was baptized, but really he never repented of anything. Like it wouldn't right. work for him. It wouldn't probably wouldn't work for him, you know? Um, but if, you know, if you have somebody, you know, whose father is a Christian, a, a baptized Christian, um, and loves the Lord, and I, I would have no, I mean, I, I don't go and run around to, you know, non-Catholic people's rooms and anoint them, you know, but, um, you know, would you like to be anointed, sir? You know, but, um, but, uh, I was thinking about that. It might not be a. They might not let me back in the hospital, actually. But if my husband, who is not Catholic, and he wanted and he loves you, and he would love for you to come, and it would, he's a baptized Christian, it would right. help him. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Father John, would that serve as a kind of a deathbed conversion as well, or is that separate? Not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, you know. Uh, well, you know, um, conversion, not necessarily denominational conversion, but a conversion of heart to be sure, you know, um, you know, for someone, for someone who maybe even had a bad life and for them at the ending of their lives to seek um, forgiveness, I mean, that's the more important conversion. You know, God's going to sort us all out denominationally, you know, and I don't think denomination, I haven't had any, any real evidence that denominations make a great deal of difference to God, you know, I think he loves us all. Um, being Italian, I think he loves me more than some, but no, I'm just teasing, but, um, but I mean, all kidding aside, um, that that's the more important conversion because that's the conversion of mind and heart. That's metanoia, you know, as St. Paul says, the renewal of your mind, of your nous, you know, which is the whole rational faculty of the person. Yeah. I don't think I have forgotten anything. Um, questions if that's okay. Pardon me? Oh. Um, that? Oh, yeah, okay. Just speak louder because I can hardly hear you. Um, can you receive multiple times? Like if you got sick, yes. and you got better and... Yes, yeah. You know, we have the, we have the circumstance now where, um, for example, maybe someone receives just as they begin to be in old age. But then perhaps they grow sick. And then perhaps their sickness increases. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps they might receive before a surgical intervention or, you know, um, at the end of life. Okay. So yeah, it, it can be conferred, the sacrament can be conferred um, I mean, not unreasonably, of course. There's, you have to have respect for the sacraments, you know, but, um, but yes, the sacrament can be conferred um, as often as in the judgment of the priest, it's spiritually beneficial to the person. Okay. And then my second question was, could you go back? Um, I, I think I heard you say part of the last rite was a apostolic. Uh, Pardon. Yeah, could you go into that a little bit more? What is that? 
Well, you know, um, the church, the church has indulgences. And the apostolic pardon is an indulgence. You know, an indulgence is the remission of temporal punishment for sin. The, the merits of, of, of Christ and the merits of the, of the um, saints, you know, their endurance of suffering, their pains of persecution and martyrdom, all of those things, um, you know, create, we believe, a, uh, a, a great uh, reserve of grace. And, and so people who approach at the ending of life or through pious works or whatever, um, the church often bestows um, partial or complete, what are called plenary indulgences. The apostolic pardon is the plenary indulgence, the, um, the freedom from any temporal punishment due to sin. Um, and so it's, it's like, um, for example, you know, we, we know that, that our, our suffering um, is, is sometimes a good thing for us because it helps us to be, um, it helps us to be mindful of, um, uh, of our, our, our need for penitence. And that's why as the season of Lent comes up, we, we perform acts of, of penitence, you know. Um, but at the ending of life, you know, we, we believe that there is, uh, that, that even if we die in grace, um, that sometimes we die um, with debt, in a sense. Um, every injury that we do through sin um, creates a harm. And we must, in our lives, do everything that we can um, to heal all of the harms that we have done, you know, and, um, you know, in a, in a, a simple example, you know, if I, if I, uh, if I steal something, um, it's not enough for me simply to go and go to confession and then, you know, to keep the, million dollars that I stole, I also have to do what? I have to give it back. I have to heal the injury which my sin has wrought, you know? And so um, an indulgence at the ending of our lives um, is a help to the healing of the injuries that we have done in this life. And it is taken from the from the vast reserve of merits of Christ and the saints to, in a sense, pay our debts to other people for the injuries and the harms that we have done for them. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yep. Hey, uh, Father, you'd mentioned something about the Q-tips. Um, I know yeah. that the priests are the only ones with the consecrated hands, right? So I'm wondering why, why, and, and you, the only the priests can do the anointing of the sick. Priests so and trying, bishops, yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to understand maybe why use a Q-tip when the hands are consecrated. Wouldn't it be better to use the consecrated hands? No, um, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because um, you know, again, grace builds upon nature. You know, it would be, um, you know, if someone has a, someone has a, a, a skin lesion, um, if there's the possibility of the transfer of disease, the, in, the, the instrument is permitted in order to, um, in order to alleviate that danger. That's the reason why the instrument is used. Okay, thank you, Father. Yeah, the blessing of the priest's hands is uh, the blessing of the priest's hands, the consecration in a sense of the priest's hands with, with oil um, is, is a, a ritual element to remind the priest of, the, of the, what his hands must be about, what his work in this world is. 
and that God has given him that capacity, um, you know, as a, uh, uh, God has given him that capacity uh, as his, as his work, his vocation in this life. So I don't see that the consecration of hands is something that in a sense, um, and there's nothing, uh, it, it's, it's a ritual and prayerful element, you know. It's just like in the distribution of Holy Communion. Um, it's, not, it's not the priest who gives the communion that's important. It's the Lord who is received in, in the Eucharist. Okay. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Any other questions? I had a question. If someone's not capable of requesting the anointment of the sick, the, the right or last rites themselves, does it have to be a family member or someone close to them that knows them that requests it? Or can it be a person like a medical worker at the hospital or? You know, I'm usually someone who's someone who we get a lot of requests from hospital chaplains and 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 everything from and sometimes also from from the the nurses and stuff because they if they know the person they've gotten to meet the person you know or if they see that the person is catholic they make the presumption sometimes that the person would want the anointing of the sick okay yeah so yeah that's a good question any other questions? I have one more, but it's kind of silly. Uh, well, there are no silly questions, but try me. <laughs> have you ever seen the BBC TV show, Father Brown? No, I never have seen that. I never <laughs> have seen that. Um, well, so it's like a murder mystery show and Father Brown always finds the person that has died, been murdered. And he always says, um, he, he always puts on the stole and starts saying prayers. So, but you said the sacrament of the sick cannot be done for someone who's already deceased. Right. You know what, what those prayers. What is Father Brown doing? Yeah. Father Brown is probably, um, if Father Brown knows his business or, if, um, and I think the Father Brown mysteries are actually written by G.K. Chesterton. Yes. And so, um, I, I trust that I, I, I trust that G.K. Chesterton knew what he was about, and if that has been faithfully carried through um, by the BBC, then um, probably what Father Brown is doing is praying the prayers of the commendation of those who have died. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. There, there come, you know, there are prayers for people who are dying, and then there are prayers for people who have died. Like at the ending of the, um, at the ending of the funeral mass, we pray the final commendation and farewell. Oh. Okay. okay? Yeah. You know, may the angels lead you to paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. And as usual, I have, um, as usual, I have talked too long. <laughs> Tantum ergo sacramentum venere murcernui et anticum documentum Novo cedat ritui, prestet fide supplementum, sensum defectui. Genitori genitoque, laus et jubilatio, salus honor virtus quoque, Sit at benedictio, procedenti abutroque, comparsit laudatio. Ah.